out of the realm. Overview. The world is a magical place, and the Empire home to some of the most proficient magicians in the world. Each season, amid all the politics and negotiation, the religious debates and the raucous parties, Anvil hosts the Imperial Conclave, where the wise and the powerful come together to discuss matters of magic. Each summit, the Imperial Regio plays host to some of the mightiest covens in the Empire, weaving powerful magical effects to shift the shuttle of fate on the loom of destiny. The winds of magic blow, and they bring tales of wonder and witchery. Frost, forest, shadow, fog and rain. During the spring equinox, Imperial magicians raised a total of seven magical fortifications across the Empire. One of them was drawn from the Spring Realm, forging the forests of Nearweald in Ossium against the depredations of the Druge. Two great castles of ice and granite were used to fortify Karaman, and were drawn from the domain of the Breath of Winter, one in Serra Damata and the other in Serra Briante, to aid the garrison of Fort Braden against the Lysambrian Jotun. Four castles of mist were raised over the fens of the Rushes and Ottomai in Bregasland, the bogs of Drownbark Forest in Ossium, and the marsh of West Marsh in Calaveza. The penumbral veils hang over the Verushkan territory of Ossium, the freeborn territories of Madruga and Karaman, and the Druge territories of the Barons and Zenith. Rituals that try to divine information about or scry into these territories will first need to overcome the power of the veil. Finally, the new enchantment Regrow the Land's Heart was performed on the territory of Skarsind. Fortuitously timed, the magic helps the farms of Skarsind weather the great drought unharmed, with the Alpine territory experiencing gentle rejuvenating rain rather than crushing heat. The magic has also helped many of the newcomers to the territory. This is most pronounced among the septs of former slaves, the newcomers from Ossium, the Marive gladiators, and the Tamazi of Axos. Even the Ethangor, Ilaraun, and Yerende have been touched by its refreshing magic. Although they had made no attempt to join the Imperial Orcs, it seems that they have at last fully accepted that they are safe from the Druge in their new homes. Through the Black Gate The Black Gate can be opened to allow masters of winter magic to commune with the spirits of the dead. For reasons that have never adequately been explained, the gate can only be opened at twilight, when it is neither quite day nor quite night. Imperial magicians prognosticate that this means that during the summer solstice, the ritual can be performed in the hour between nine and ten, this information is, of course, of particular relevance to the Imperial Necromancer, given their powers and responsibilities. The Tamazi During the spring equinox, the Imperial Senate voted to expand the College of Warcasting in Skarsind. Work was completed shortly before the summer solstice, and the College has been deluged with applications from members of the Tamazi Sept of Orcs. Even more hearteningly, the willingness of the Imperial Orcs to help the Tamazi master the arts of battle magic has gone a long way towards convincing them that they will be accepted as equals. Another wave of Tamazi speaking with the Egregore and becoming part of the nation follows. Not only Tamazi wish to join the college, the expansion of the grounds also sees record numbers of young Imperial Orcs applying, as well as former Marive gladiators who feel the call of the Warcaster's art. As yet, none of the bone carvers, the elders of the Tamazi sept, have taken that step, however. While polite and friendly with Skarsind orcs, and orcs of the other septs when they meet them, they remain very much insulated from the Imperial orcs by their fellow Tamazi. They don't seem to be hostile, just cautious, seeing how bonding with the Egregore affects their fellow Tamazi. Also during the spring equinox, the Imperial Conclave upheld a declaration of concord raised by Emetius, the Archmage of Winter, which invited Tamazi to speak with them about studying winter law. There has apparently been significant discussion about this invitation. The bone carvers are intrigued about expanding their mastery of magical laws, but they are also cautious. They seem to believe that the Urizen, in particular, are close friends with their former masters, the citadels of Axos. 
This tempers their enthusiasm for the Archmage's offer. However, encouraged by the successful expansion of the College of Warcasting, they have let it be known that they intend to send some of their number to Anvil during the autumn equinox, to see the heart of the Empire first hand, during which there will be opportunities to speak with the Archmage, with magicians of other Imperial nations, and to see how the humans treat the Imperial Orcs first hand. Ghosts in Wintermark The settlement of Terelva in Brookland, Harnmark, tells of a recent influx of restless spirits in nearby lands. They do not yet seem to pose a direct threat to anyone. Nobody has been hurt. But their anguished wails and terrible countenance are disturbing, and many fear for these souls trapped outside the labyrinth. They have discovered that the ghosts seem to fall quiet during gatherings of singing and storytelling, but only briefly. A bold ice walker named Topi the Swift has spent some time among the spirits, and believes that they are the ghosts of a group of Frey last seen preparing to meet with a scop. After several years questing to restore their skeins, they were hoping to be bestowed with new heroic deed names. It is thought that the whole group was swallowed up by the ice, either poor fortune or foul play, just before the ceremony began. Their lingering souls have presumably linked with anchors that prevent exorcism, and these too have been swallowed by the ice. Toppy believes, however, that there is no need for exorcism. Beneath their anguished wails, the ghosts simply crave the approval of scops. Music and poetry silences their wails, and a group of performers bold enough to drown out their cries might begin to calm them. If this could grant them enough respite to come forth and speak of their deeds, recognising them might just be enough to allow them to pass on. A conjunction of the Sentinel Gate has been identified at 11 on Saturday evening that will allow a large group of 50 to reach the woodland near Terelva, should any Scops be brave enough to test out Toppy's theory. Reeve of the Summerlands Barian, the Lord of the Crossroads, invites the Ice Walkers of Wintermark and several other challengers to join him at the Semmerstones in Kaus at two o'clock on Saturday afternoon of the coming solstice. Those who believe they have completed their challenge and stand ready to claim their reward will find the way is open for them to travel to the Grove of Thousands. This place is favoured by the Lords of the Summerlands, a grove that lies halfway between the Empire and the Summer Realm, there the Lord of the Crossroads will conduct a ceremony of rewarding. Barrien will meet with all the challengers there. He is expecting two of them to present a performance as the culmination of their challenge. The remainder need only present themselves to receive their rewards. The known challengers are the Ice Walkers of Wintermark, who will be expected to perform a Suak painting ceremony detailing their quest to gain storied items from across the realms. Osrin of House Ortzel will perform his work composed according to the challenge investigations on the theme of love. Podeen Halfthorn and Odelia Nelda. Barian also plans to meet with William Guildenstern and Gemma Brightsmith at a separate ceremony at the Autumn Equinox. In addition, as is now common, Heralds of Barian will be abroad in Anvil to seek out those who are engaged in a challenge, to find out how they are progressing and to offer what aid they can. Revel and his fellow herald Temper will be in Lumis of Wintermark on Friday evening from around 7pm. In particular, they hope to meet with a number of citizens. Members of the House of Gilded Vine and House Talstag about the challenges cast in their name at the Spring Equinox. Rin Gierskogol, who is being offered a chance to discuss the terms for the final stages of their challenge. Anyone who has recently completed their challenge or whose challenge completes this solstice, especially if they need to ask any questions about the rewarding ceremony that Barian is holding in Semahom. Temper is particularly keen to hear how the challenges of House Aurelius and Edric Fjellrevening are progressing. Patron of the Spires Last season, Prospero met with Edmundo of Damacan's Forge, Archmage of Autumn, in Parley. The meeting led to an agreement being made between the Autumn Archmage and the Weaver setting in place the patronage of the College of the Spires. The Imperial Conclave recognised Prospero as a friend of the Empire, and almost immediately after the Spring Equinox, 
Dozens of golden spiders from the autumn realm descended on Urizen. Literally descended. The golden spiders, each one around the size of a sheep, drifted down out of the night sky wherever functioning helioptagon towers are located across Morrow, Redoubt and even Spiral. There is some consternation, but the spiders are entirely peaceful and present themselves politely to the Urizen operating the towers. They speak in soft, breathy voices and are fascinated by the mechanisms that control the lanterns. Their presence allows messages to be sent faster and more efficiently, reducing breakage and errors. They are also excellent sounding boards, more than happy to chat with any scholar who is stumped by a magical problem. Within a few weeks they have apparently internalised a register of every magician in Urizen who contributes to the College of the Spires, and have an uncanny ability to bring together scholars whose expertise is complementary. All they ask in return are gifts of oracalcum, which are carefully wrapped in golden silk and apparently sent back to the city of Bridges. As long as the spiders are free to operate in Urizen, whenever they are codifying a ritual, the doyen of the spires can call on the assistance of the spiders to speed up the process. Doing so requires payment in the form of oracalcum. The first five ranks of additional research in a season cost 20 ingots of oracalcum. The next five ranks will cost a further 42 ingots, for a total of 62. The next five ranks will cost another 86 ingots, and so on, doubling the cost and adding two ingots for each further additional five ranks of research within the same season. Unlike the additional benefits provided a College of Magic by a specialisation, this additional research speed is not restricted to any one magical realm. The Prince of Ties may favour autumn magic, but his spiders are able to assist in codification in all six magical laws. Working with the Golden Spiders is not possible if the Sovereign Lord of the City of Bridges is under the enmity of the Imperial Conclave, however. They will not necessarily depart if the Conclave turns against Prospero, but they will not offer their aid. There is one further restriction on this agreement. Any ritual codified in whole or in part with the aid of the Golden Spiders may not be entered into Imperial law. It may be used freely by Imperial magicians or entered into Urizen law, but if it is made part of Imperial law that will break the agreement with Prospero to serve as patron and he will be very angry. It is presumed that by ensuring the rituals created with his aid are not readily available to every Imperial magician, this will promote the kinds of negotiation and favour trading between the Empire's wizards that the City of Bridges relishes. Some Urizen comment that it is surprisingly serendipitous that the spiders have appeared when they have, given that the current doyen, Marcus, was chosen to oversee work on the ritual Quick Study, which will enchant a college of magic to work even more effectively. No Surrender Last season, Volstan, raucous herald of Cathan Cane, met with Exarch Luke of the Navigators of Virtue, Archmage of Summer, among others, in a parley held in the Hall of Worlds. A number of matters were discussed, including who would represent the Lady of the Frost in the upcoming tournament for patronage of the Icy Crag of the Eternal Sun. Volstan also delivered a message regarding the Immovable One's opinion of the recent treaties conceding Imperial land to foreign enemies. Specifically, if the Imperial Senate cedes any more regions or territories to foreign powers, then she will cease offering her support to the Empire. Apparently, the Lady of the Glacial Keep considers ceding Imperial territory tantamount to surrender, something the Immovable One has no patience for and cannot respect. Civil Exchange This conclave thanks the Calway for all the opportunities provided to us and appreciate them even though we are logistically unable to pursue them and hope that we can continue to work together in future. Ariadne of the Auric Horizon, Spring Equinox 384YE Valeria of the Citadel of Highwatch offered a chance for the nation of Urizen to receive the support of Zakalway, following a mandate raised by Maximilian Ancarian to encourage cooperation with Eternals in support of virtuous endeavours. The chance to expand the Citadel of Highwatch to gain support in the war against the Druge was due to have ended at the end of the last summit, but the declaration from Ariadne of Auric Horizon has further encouraged Agon the Polemarch of Clarity, and so the opportunity 
remains until the end of summer solstice 384YE. The Setting Suns of Kuroz Under normal circumstances, the eternal Kayla is relatively neutral to the Empire. She offers her boons or withdraws them as she sees fit. She is happy to aid the Empire or parley with the Winter Archmage when it suits her. Shortly before the summer solstice, however, she shows a different side to her personality. Specifically, she declares a bounty on the coven of the Sons of Kuroz. The source of her displeasure is not made clear, but her heralds claim that a few years ago she warned the Sons of Kuroz not to use her ritual clarion call of ivory and dust. Those who disrespect the Queen of Silence should not seek to steal her boons. During the spring equinox, the Sons of Kuroz stole three of her grim legions. They will fight when summoned, that is the agreement she made when she allowed the ritual to first be created, but for every cadre of her warriors stolen in this fashion, she will provide three to barbarians opposing the highborn armies. As a consequence, nine cadres of grim legionnaires will fight alongside the Druge during the coming season. Her herald appears to believe that their mistress warned imperial magicians this would happen, and coldly points out that by testing the end of stars they have arguably used magic to aid the enemies of the Empire. Perhaps the Conclave might wish to use the tools available to it to reflect their displeasure. Each time the sons of Kuros steal her grim legionaries she will do the same. She will do so not only when they perform the ritual as part of their own coven, but also when they contribute to other performances of the ritual. She is not merciless, however. At least, not in this regard. There is a ritual that allows the dying to pass through the final portal to Kayla's realm and be judged by her. Those she deems worthy join her grim legion, while those who are not ready are reduced to dust. At least one copy of this ritual, Abandon the Mortal Shackles, was given to Imperial magicians since the death of Empress Britta. If a copy of this ritual by any name is located and one of the sons of Kauros raises a successful declaration of imperial law for it, then she will forgive the highborn for their slight and end her grievance with them. Wisdom During the meeting with Wise Rangara's representative at the last summit, it was agreed that she would displace Agrament as the patron of the Marsh Stand Skerry in Ossium. One final step is necessary. The Imperial Conclave must politely ask her to take up residence as patron of the stone itself. A declaration of concord will be sufficient as long as it passes. There is no need to give her amity, merely to ensure she is not under enmity. She makes it clear, however, that she will expect the sacrifices to continue. Some query is raised as to whether our Halogen, the other patron of Marsh Stanskeri, would need to agree. Wise Rangara's herald apparently laughed for a full minute before retorting that nobody in the Winter Realm, and certainly not Wise Rangara, gives two rotten figs for what the Spider King does or does not agree to. Blackness And finally, forty years ago, a cabal of magicians from the League calling themselves the Childer of the Black Drop, apparently inspired by the possibly fictional character Esconius of Highgard, set out to learn everything they could about the hateful eternal agrament. They committed themselves to collecting every scrap of lore they could find about the eternal, apparently hoping to find some kind of weakness that could be exploited to protect the Empire completely from his depredations. According to Dusty Records, all thirteen members of the Cabal were perhaps inevitably declared sorcerers by the Imperial Conclave in summer 354YE. In pursuit of their quest, they had apparently used magic in very unwise ways, mastering rituals that drew on the power of blood on the snow to better understand his dark temptations. They were unrepentant, and seven of their members were killed in the resulting fracas. Five of them, Johann Perivail von Savos, Wilhelm Ecazo de Temeshoir, Padik Tarvin of Tassato Mestre, Tomazzi Dupin de Holberg, and Joyeda Watika de Tassato Mestra were unaccounted for. They were assumed to have fled the Empire. A month ago, 
The bodies of four of them were discovered in a cottage in the Vardstein Vale by scouts exploring the area around Lorenzo's deep pockets. They had been dead for at least a month, perhaps longer, and as near as could be ascertained, Johann had been poisoned with the Crimson Gate. Tomazzi Dupin had fallen out of a window and hanged by his own splendid cloak. Padique Tarvin was discovered with five vicious daggers embedded in his back, but with no sign of a struggle. Wilhelm was found at the dinner table, a half-full glass of Dornish wine still in one hand, and with no sign of how he died, his body transformed to stone through use of Mark the Flesh Incorruptible, concealing the cause of death. There were place settings for five, but only four bodies. A mystery that has baffled the magistrates. Even more mysterious is the presence in the cottage of a large trunk inlaid with welt-silver runes of Aish, Sula, and Ophis. The trunk itself was empty. Of Joyeda Watika de Tassato Mestra there was no sign, nor was there any sign of the Childer of the Black Drops library, assuming it still exists. <laughs>